Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Christopher Hobbs, and I'm leading the meeting tonight. I'm the vicar here, and a socially distant welcome to you. There are people from St. John's Toft, from Emmanuel Community Church, Reddish, from Emmanuel Church, Cheadle Hume, St. Andrew's Cheadle Hume, Ford's Lane Church, St. Mary's Church, and maybe another one I'm not sure of, but welcome to you all. And um, this is... We used to call it the Cheadle and District Bible Convention, and then it was deeper, and now we're calling it South Manchester Keswick, and the Keswick Fellowship is very okay with that, and they'd like us to say that, did you know you can go to Keswick live this year? Yeah, from the 17th of July is the first week, 24th of July the second week, and the 31st of July the third week, and maybe we'll look into whether we can also transmit it locally, I don't know, but we're now 
officially connected in fellowship with the Keswick Convention. Anyway, let's bow our heads as we come together tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you that we are brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ because of your great mercy and love to us in Jesus' death for our sins. Thank you that uh, you continue to feed us with words that are life and spirit. And we pray as we gather tonight that you would refresh us and uh, change our minds and hearts where they need to be changed and lead us as followers of the Lord Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen. And we actually need to be giving, to, giving thanks to God all the time and um, the whole day, whether it's a very ordinary day for us and nothing unusual has happened or whether it's been a difficult or even a painful day, we should be giving thanks to God all the time and we're going to remind one another of that in our first song. And I think you can sing quietly behind your masks. And David Haslam, he told me something new. I always thought you had to wear them like that. No, blue outside, anyway. <laughs> so do sing. Why don't we uh, stand? We should stand just to complete the song together. Beautiful state of all my deeds. worship his holy name together and as has been said let's just uh, enjoy this time of worship being together here gathered around God's word at our school thank you <laughs>
Would you please be seated? And could Jonathan, our drummer, come over here to the microphone, please? Not just our drummer. This is Jonathan, the pastor at Ford Lane, Ford's Lane Church. And um, there, are no, there are only two questions here. Tell us about your past and tell us about your present. Because tomorrow you're going to tell us about your future. But about your past. Jonathan, where do you come from? Uh, originally from Kent. Like, are you a man of Kent or a Kentish man? I'm, where, a, I'm a man of Kent because I was born uh, on the... Uh, east of the Medway. Yep. He wants to know that, didn't he? Yeah, well, I was trying to work if out... If you are born that. west of the Medway, you'd be a Kentish man. Right. And um, did, did you live there until you went away to uh, No, I lived there until my teens, and then we moved to London. So, uh, London's... I've always considered London home, really, I suppose, because my parents are from London, my in-laws are from London, my wife's from London. So, there we are. And... Uh, did you go away to college or uni? Or what yes, did you do yeah. when you left school? Yeah, I did all that kind of stuff, and then I went to Spain for 20 years. I'm jumping ahead, but there you we are. You are a bit jumping ahead. So what, what did you study before you went? Politics, to... mainly, European studies. Right. So. And had, were you learning Spanish as part of that? Uh, well, a little bit, but not very much. Um, that's not because I didn't try. It just wasn't actually a very big part of the course, uh, honestly. But um, I really learned Spanish when I actually went to Spain. I went on a summer camp, first of all. A little building project, a mission building project, and uh, and then after that, I uh, went back and helped with children's camps. And then I thought it'd be nice to learn a language to actually speak to these people. Uh, and so I went out and, and found a job. And presumably that was a kind of a, a mission kind of help. You were already a Christian when you yes, yes, I yes, was, yes, yes, I was, yes. And uh, where had you become a Christian? At home, really. I was brought up uh, in a Christian home, and uh, I remember very clearly as a teenager coming home from a prayer meeting one night and just uh, recognizing that Jesus was the answer, really. And I, I kind of asked him, you know, in a very sort of childlike way uh, to come into my life, to change me. I'm not quite sure what words I used. And I confess I went to bed and thought that next morning I probably wouldn't, you know, follow on from that. But actually next morning I knew I was different. So uh, I've kind of held on to that uh, all through life's ups and downs. And there have been some downs as well as ups. You know, I'm not what? pretending it's all been, you know, uh, doubt and... Uh, Right. Oh, Faith. that kind of down. Right. Yeah. And so you went to Spain, yes. and then did you come back, or you, you sort of stayed uh, there? Well, I did, uh, I did uh, jump out for the odd year uh, to do some Bible school training, uh, college training, and also I did a PGC because I was teaching English, so uh, to get a qualification in that, uh, teaching English as a foreign language. So I did both of those things back here, um, but then went back to Spain again, as it were. Uh, until they invited me to Bramall. Now, the northwest is quite different from London, and it's quite different from Spain. How did they hear about you? Um, well, actually, I was visiting another church uh, where uh, one of the, the leader's brother <laughs> was from Ford's Lane Church, and he said to me that they were looking for a pastor. Would I be uh, happy for my name to be passed on? And I said, yes, that's fine. And one thing led to another. And... Uh, someone told me you have been at Ford's Lane for quite a few years. Sixteen. And how many years were you in Spain? Twenty. Oil of Ule or something. It's unbelievable, isn't it? But anyway, so... And I'm still only 45. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so you've been... And you, someone told me you were the first pastor of Ford's Lane. Yes, that's true. So what did they do before that? You'd have to ask them. Oh. Um, uh, well, it was a Brethren Church uh, by um, in, in its foundation, and so they had a you know uh, they've always had a, that one. What say they and we have always had a team ministry, uh, an eldership, a plurality of elders, and um, and just they'd never had a pastor before. But uh, some years ago, they decided that they really needed one or wanted one, and so they began the process. I think it took them about 14 years to find one, but. Uh, <laughs> And so it's just as well I was there 16, really. It's just about beaten that. So. Right. And you've been there, and what would you say have been some highlights of, for you being there in Ford's Lane? Um, well, I, th I think the people first and foremost. Uh, I mean, a church is a people, obviously. And just tremendously uh, God-loving, really. 
I think. Um, I've been impressed at the, the spiritual maturity that I found in the church. And um, we've been blessed, uh, particularly, it's usually, it's usually the ladies, isn't it, who kind of lead the way in that. Uh, and we have uh, quite a number of godly ladies. But I was always struck from, the, from day one how many older godly men there were in the congregation. And that seemed to give a kind of a real stability to the church. Prayer warriors and, uh, uh, and with great Bible knowledge and love of, love of the Lord, really. And uh, so I felt tremendously supported from day one. So that was a highlight. Um, I, I've always valued the, the leadership team that we've had, which has been tremendously united. We've known how to uh, disagree amicably when we've needed to, I think, um, rarely. But you, generally, we've been unanimous, I think, on the Lord has really cared for us in that regard. And when I first came a few years ago, there was something, it might have been called Men of Faith or something like that. It was a Men of Praise. Men of Praise, a band that you're you were involved in where you've we've yeah, doing I, this where you're playing the drums yeah, all the time no all the way through your yes, pastorate right. at Ford's Lane or no no that's only the last up? few years I think it's the 10th anniversary this year though somebody was saying I think I'm looking for some inspiration but um uh yeah so it's been a bit covided out at the moment so yeah um probably only about eight years of actually playing I think <laughs> In fact, we were probably one of your last gigs yeah, before, probably, yes, probably were. before... So we'll blame you for the, <laughs> before, for the virus. Before okay. COVID. Well, we've heard a bit about your past, a bit about your present. We're nosy. We'd like to find out more, but we, we're not going to oh, now. Okay. Sorry. Oh, no, that's fine. <laughs> we're, that's you, I was up. Donald, are you going to lead us into this next song, Thank You for the Cross? Or do you want me to say some word? Oh, no, well, I mean, it's speaking of the great sacrifice of God himself in Jesus Christ. And tonight's theme is a great sacrifice. So we're going to sing this song, uh, Thank You for the Cross. Let's stand again.
And now Diane Turner from Emmanuel Church is going to come and read Genesis 22, and you'll find it on page 22 in the Bibles in the church. Reading from Genesis chapter 22, page 22 of the Church Bibles. Some time later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son, Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Then Abraham returned to his servants, and they set off together for Beersheba, and Abraham stayed in Beersheba. Sometime later, Abraham was told, Milcah is also a mother. She has borne sons to your brother Nahor, Uz the firstborn, Buz his brother, Kemuel the father of Aram, Kased, Hazo, Pildash, Jidlaf, and Bethuel. Bethuel became the father of Rebekah. Milcah bore the, these eight sons to Abraham's brother Nahor. His concubine, whose name was Ruma, also had sons, Teba, Gaham, Tahash, and Meaka. This is the word of the Lord. So before Jonathan comes and speaks to us on that passage, We're going to contemplate God as we sing together to that that Lord who called out from heaven, Behold our God.
Well, a very good evening to you, and uh, it's lovely to be with you. Thank you, Christopher, for your uh, welcome. I'd like to say that, uh, as I smash the microphone, it's been a great privilege uh, over the last, well, I guess nearly 15 years or so, uh, being involved in helping organise uh, this convention. I trust that uh, the old adage of a prophet has honour except in his own town won't come home to roost uh, this evening or tomorrow. But it's a great privilege to have been involved uh, in this uh, deeper conference, and the very title gives the game away, really. Uh, the aim is to have time and opportunity to go a little deeper into uh, God's Word. And to open up it, uh, open up God's Word, that is, in such a way that we get excited enough about the Bible so that we're excited enough to put the lessons we learn into practice. That's the aim of the exercise. And tonight and tomorrow night, God willing, we're going to look at Old Testament narrative, Old Testament stories. It's such a tragedy to me that many Christians struggle with the Old Testament when it's full of stories, and who doesn't love a story? And there are great stories of God and his people uh, for us to learn from. And in doing so, I hope we're going to avoid <coughs> excuse me, two extremes uh, that uh, are all too common in church preaching, or all too easy for people like me to fall into. One is the approach which takes them merely as stories, perhaps with a moral or two, uh, then spiritualizes them. In other words, it, it draws out uh, some spiritual lesson from them for us. But it never gets to Jesus, and it leaves the stories themselves, in fact, distant from our own experience. The second approach, which perhaps is more typical, dare I suggest, in the kind of church uh, or kind of churches that organise this conference, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, a frog in the throat, uh, maybe more typical, as I say, in our kind of churches, that takes them as illustrating spiritual lessons, but then jumps too quickly to Jesus, which ironically also leaves the stories distant from our own experience. So I'll leave you to judge whether I avoid both those pitfalls uh, in our two evenings. It's easy to say what I'm not going to do, what are we going to at least try and do? Well, immerse ourselves in the original, the biblical context of the story and take some deliberate steps through the material to try and ascertain how it points to Jesus and how it relates to us. And along the way, we'll try and identify perhaps where the other two approaches go wrong. Now, I've intentionally picked uh, for this evening a well-known but difficult story in Genesis 22 and a much obscurer one tomorrow. Uh, so we'll see how this approach works on very different material. Tomorrow we'll look at the lion, the prophet, and the wardrobe. Yeah, the title's a bit contrived. Tonight we turn to Genesis 22 and father and son, who makes the sacrifice? The chapter opens with the words, after these things. Uh, words that are true, of course, of every single Bible passage, I suppose, well, except Genesis 1. But the Bible is God's progressive revelation as he opens up on his plans bit by bit. So when God speaks to Abraham in verse 1, he doesn't do so in a void. There's a backstory. What things have gone before? Well, I suppose, how long have you got? Quite a lot has gone before God's call to Abraham, bringing him into Canaan and promising it to his descendants. Descendants, yes, God promised him lots of those as well. But years have gone by. Childbearing age has passed and no son has appeared. So they tried the DIY, the DIY route via Hagar, which does produce a son, but he's not God's man. And then finally, Isaac is born, the child of the promise. And as recently as the previous chapter, Genesis 21, God told Abraham, your offspring will be traced through Isaac. Now, Abraham is often, rightly, held up as a model of faith. Uh, and if we fail to see that in Genesis 22, I think we haven't been listening. But another part of the things which have gone before is that on two separate occasions, Abraham pretended his wife, Sarah, was actually his sister. Well, she was his half-sister, so maybe it was a half-truth. Because he was scared. They would kill him to take her. So faith 
is being learned. Uh, that's encouraging, I think, as we struggle through the process ourselves. Uh, not even Abraham reached the faith-busting heights of chapter 22 on day one. So what helped him in his growth? Well, in chapter 21, several issues are resolved. The rivalry and jealousy in the home is dealt with when Hagar and Ishmael are sent away. Abraham makes a peace treaty with a local chieftain, Abimelech. He recovers ownership of the well that he dug at Beersheba, which guarantees his water supply, and he calls on the name of the Lord. Everything, then, in the garden is rosy. He's prosperous. He's at peace. And his future succession is guaranteed through Isaac. God is good. After these things, God tested Abraham. That's not how it's supposed to be, is it? Just when he thought he could sit of an evening in his rocking chair on the terrace, sipping his glass of Merlot, watching the sunset and playing backgammon with Isaac, insert ancient Middle Eastern equivalent, I wonder, does the chapter open with an explanation because of the harrowing subject matter that follows? God tested Abraham. That's what's going on. Though Abraham probably didn't know that at the time. A couple in our church moved to this area two years ago when the husband retired to be near their children and grandchildren. They had great plans, which included really getting stuck into the life of the church. They're gifted people, committed, faithful, spiritually mature. And then the wife fell seriously ill with cancer and died just about a week ago. All their plans first thing I said to them when I saw them after they got that news is, well, maybe not the first thing, but among the first things is this is when our theology has to kick in. Do we really believe or don't we? God tested Abraham. Well, here's some theology to get our teeth into, and it starts not where we're so prone to begin with ourselves, but with God. Here is the creator God who made everything, the universe. Here is the sovereign God who rules over all, whose complete authority over all he has made, including us. Here is the holy God of the burning bush. Take off your shoes and worship. Here is the God who gives life. Oh, and takes it away. He doesn't owe us anything, does he? We owe him our allegiance. So what kind of God are we following? Is he the God of the Bible, the God who so loved the world that he sent his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life? The God who in Jesus one day will return to this earth and before whom every knee will bow? The God who tests his people. Now he tests us because he knows how frail we are, how easily we wander away from him, how often our weak faith needs strengthening. It might say more about me and my failings, or it might, in a funny kind of way, encourage you to hear this from a church minister, but quite often I find myself reading a passage of Scripture and thinking, I've never noticed that before. Well, I was working my way through Leviticus in my Read the Bible in a Year plan, which usually takes me about 18 months, and I reached chapter 26, right near the end of the book. It's where God lists out the blessings he has ready for his people in the Promised Land if they obey him when they get there. But what knocked me for six was the extent of the promises. Rain at the right time, great harvests, plenty of food, complete security in the land, dangerous animals removed. I like that one. I assume that meant no dogs. And then on top of all the physical promises, God says, I will walk among you and be your God and you will be my people. My goodness, it's virtually a return to the Garden of Eden. But flick over a few chapters and back come the spies from that very same land where he promised to give them the most wonderful existence. This is what they said. Indeed it is, flowing with milk and honey. And here is some of its fruit. However, we can't attack the people because they're stronger than we are. The land we pass through to explore is one that devours its inhabitants. And all the people we saw in it are men of great size. To ourselves, we seem like grasshoppers, and we must have seemed the same to them. God's response? 
Well, the 10 spies who brought back that negative report dropped dead. And the rest of the people who bought the report wandered in the desert for 40 years until all of them also died. And not one of the faithless people, not one of those who failed to believe, reached the promised land. So be glad if God only tests you. Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, James 1. But do we know this, I wonder? I think James realizes that we seldom enjoy tests, but that the outcome is worth it. Blessed is the one who endures trials, he says, because when he stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. So the secret is knowing the God who sends the test, knowing the promises that he's made, and that they cannot be overturned or changed, and also trusting that the test will lead us towards that crown of life. And I think we see this worked out in Genesis 22. Here I am, Abraham answered in verse 1. <laughs> now, without wishing to fall foul of my own critique of spiritualization, it's more than simply saying, I'm in the kitchen, or wherever he happened to be. It reflects a willingness, doesn't it, to listen to what the Lord has to say. It's the reply of the servant. It's what Eli taught Samuel to say, isn't it? Take your son, he said, your only son Isaac, whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. It does not get easier however many times you read it. The instructions are clear, if stark, with the only information pending the exact hill on which Abraham is to make the sacrifice and which presumably God is going to point out to him when he gets there. Now, if someone made a film of this story, you could imagine several things happening at this point. A, a, a scene where Abraham agonizes over the instruction, question it, perhaps, perhaps even questioning God himself, complaining to God in prayer. Then there would be a sleepless night as a tearful Sarah screamed, why? And Abraham could only say, well, because God told me to, and so forth. But there's none of that in the Bible. It would have been both understandable and I think in line with some of the Psalms for Abraham to have spent some hours in deep and desperate reflection as he wrestled with this unique command. Who else has ever been asked to do such a thing? But that's not the point of the passage. We're simply not told what Abraham thought, we're told what he did. And that's important for our application. However, neither should we just jump to the end and say, well, it's all right because we know how it turned out. If you read the story quite quickly and you get to the happy ending, it's perhaps easier to gloss over some of the awkward details. But if you stop and ponder them, the episode really does raise one or two very deep philosophical issues. Does God have the right to take life and to give it? Don't answer too readily. What if it were your son on the block? And why would God ask for child sacrifice, which was associated with pagan religious practices? And it's no good saying, well, he didn't really mean it. He always planned to provide a ram because Abraham didn't know that, did he? We'll come back to that. And secondly, then, Abraham obeys God in verses 3 to 6. <clears throat> So Abraham got up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took with him two of his young men and his son Isaac. <clears throat> now, this isn't the first time that Abraham has set out on a journey in obedience to a command from God without knowing the exact destination. Do you remember the Lord said to Abram, go out from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to the land that I will show you? So Abram went as the Lord had told him, <laughs> or as Hebrews 11 puts it rather more uh, succinctly in that great chapter of, of examples of faith, he went out even though he didn't know where he was going. But on both occasions, Abraham knew why he was going. I think we can apply that quite clearly in our lives, can't we? Often we don't know where we're going, but we know why we're going there. He was obeying God. So is it better to take the comfortable path that we understand and that we think we control, or the difficult path, but the one on which God has promised to go with us. The path of accommodation or the path of discipleship. The path of stagnation or the path of growth. 
After so many years of uncertainty, things have just settled down at home for Abraham. But God doesn't save us for a nice, quiet retirement. He saves us to follow him, to obey him, and to build up our faith in him. And this episode does just that for Abraham. Obedience pays. It pays in blessing, it pays in relief, and it pays in joy. It pleases God, and there's nothing better than knowing God's pleasure. Remember the words from heaven at Jesus' baptism? This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. In Jesus, this is something that he says via our adoption into his family of all his people. So on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Those who are hoping for a parallel to be made with the resurrection, sorry, you'll have to wait. It's not here. It's just that Mount Moriah was three days' journey from Beersheba. It's a long time to walk, knowing what you had to do when you get there, mind. Two big words, I think, in verse 5 take us to the heart of things. Worship and we. Now, in our kind of churches, we're often at pains to point out that worship doesn't just mean music. Singing God's praise is certainly part of worship, but worship is a much broader category. However, I wonder if we have quite such a broad idea in our minds as Abraham. Sacrificing his son equals worship. It's Romans 12 in action, isn't it? Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. And I think it's tempting to see Genesis 22 behind that as Paul urges the Christians in Rome to give their all for the Lord. Abraham putting Isaac on the altar is literally a living sacrifice. But it's Abraham's faith in the God that he knows that gives him the strength to do the unthinkable and to be on the verge of slaying his own son. And then the little word that everybody has noticed, the boy and I will go over there to worship, then we will come back to you. Now, as we see later, Abraham believed God was perfectly capable of bringing Isaac back from the dead and that he would have to do so if Abraham sacrificed him. So I don't think Abraham is yet thinking I won't need to go through with this. What he's focused on is obedience, and that too is worship. He also holds on to the promise that God is going to build a nation through Isaac, so his son must live for that to happen. And I think there might also be that quiet confidence which comes from the mature believer who has learnt to trust God. If he said he will do something, he will do it. Now, I'm sure Abraham is wondering how, in that situation, God is going to keep his promise, but that's God's business. That's not for Abraham to worry about. So to answer my question, God does have the right to take our lives as and when he sees fit. Our days are numbered by him. Life is his gift. Better to die younger and more faithful than to die physically and spiritually decrepit, if you'll forgive the expression. God sometimes saves us, doesn't he, from ourselves by taking us when he does. So let's live and die the truth that for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. As for the child sacrifice element, uh, the only answer I can see is that it points to Christ from a situation of cultural relevance. Ultimately, of course, God has no intention of letting Abraham take Isaac's life, and after the event confirms that he's nothing like Chemosh, for instance, the god of the Moabites, to whom child sacrifices were made. So God commands something which was known in the culture. The net result is that no such sacrifice could ever placate God, just as it didn't with the pagan gods, really, but that God himself was the only one who could provide the ultimate sacrifice. His own son, whom he loved. And, of course, that child sacrifice did go through. Who is like our God? As we've been singing. No other God offers themselves as the sacrifice for our wrong. And Genesis 22 points unmistakably to Calvary. You may recall the hoo-ha a few years ago when some attacks were made on the traditional understanding of the atonement, that Jesus died as our substitute to pay the price of our sin. Nothing new in attacks on that view, of course, but you may recall that the phrase cosmic child abuse was bandied about. 
And I wonder if Genesis 22 is teaching us about the horrors of child sacrifice precisely because this was the length to which God went to save us. Food for thought, I think. Thirdly, in verses 7 and 8, God will provide. Because now in verse 7, for the first time in our passage, the other key person involved, Isaac, speaks. Uh, We don't know how old Isaac is here. Uh, Jewish tradition says 37, because that's the maximum that he could be, but that would hardly make him a boy. He's strong enough to carry the wood, as we'll see, and that's key because it means he was old enough to have resisted being tied up on the altar. Uh, We don't have to imagine they've been silent for three days, but it's what he says here that's important. There's no lamb for the sacrifice. Now, Isaac would have seen enough sacrifices to know that an animal is central to a whole thing. It's kind of the point. The animal takes the place of the person, and if the heart of the person offering it is right, God accepts it instead of demanding death as sin deserves. Well, human death. He accepts the animal death in lieu. Now, I love mountains, uh, especially reaching the summit and lapping up the view, well, if the clouds aren't down. And dare I say that God seems to like mountains too. Although later in Israel's history, pagan high places came to dominate much of the religious practice in the land, they didn't have a monopoly on mountaintop altars. Uh, God had his special mountain at Horeb or Sinai. Uh, Elijah defeated the false prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. And here God selects a mountain in Moriah for Abraham to offer up Isaac. Centuries later, it will be here that Solomon would build the temple, uh, while Jesus, of course, was crucified on a hill outside Jerusalem, perhaps close enough to be considered the same hill or group of hills that we have here. And without wishing to make a pun, the high point theologically comes in verse 8, as Abraham and Isaac trudge up the hill, and Abraham says God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. Shades of Caiaphas, I think, speaking better than he knew. What a prophecy, but we're jumping ahead. (laughs) Well, the answer seems to have satisfied Isaac, but what did Abraham mean? Clearly, we've reached, haven't we, the, the, the crux of the whole passage, and it gives us the opportunity, I think, to explain again what it is that we're doing here over these two nights in unpacking and applying Old Testament narrative. Here we have God's dealings with a man that are both an example of his dealings with us And also a pointer to how a holy God can deal with us because of what Jesus has done. So the theme of the sacrificial lamb is found, of course, throughout Scripture, from the Old Testament sacrifices as here, through the requirements of the Mosaic law, to Isaiah's great prophecy of Jesus' death as a lamb going to the slaughter, to John the Baptist, who seeing Jesus pass by remarked, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Right through to the crucifixion taking place at the very time that the lambs were killed for Passover. Or we could go on to Philip's explanation of the Isaiah passage to the Ethiopian eunuch as they sat in the chariot, or to Paul's challenge to the Christians at Corinth on the basis that Christ, our and their Passover lamb, has been crucified. We could go further, right through to the great vision of John in Revelation, where he hears countless numbers of angels saying, worthy is the lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Do you see how this brings a passage like Genesis 22 so much more alive? It points, doesn't it, to the whole sweep of Scripture. It adds how it adds layers to its meaning. Yes, we start with Abraham, but we build up to that massive celestial crescendo of praise to the lost, slaughtered lamb and savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you were Pentecostals, you'd be jumping up and down now, but... I trust you're doing so inwardly. But you get the point, don't you? God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. Abraham knew a life had to be taken. That's the definition of a sacrifice. But Isaac, even though he dies, must live for the promise to be fulfilled. So another life must be taken in substitution for his. You see, Abraham looked forward to greater things to come, anticipating the saviour. As Jesus himself told the Jewish leaders, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. 
We don't need to spend time wondering exactly how much Abraham knew or didn't know about the Messiah to come, but we do need to read the scriptures and to find Jesus in them. It's not special codes or deeply hidden meanings. It's a case, isn't it, of all of it pointing in one way or another to Jesus. And Abraham, as he responds to Isaac's very reasonable question, answers with the great gospel truth. God will provide for himself the sacrifice. Every other religion, you provide the sacrifices. But the Christian faith, God provides it. He didn't yet know there would be a ram caught in the bushes, but he did know that God would one day deal with the whole problem of sin. The problem which separates God from us, by the way, not just us from God. So what principle may we apply to what we might term the incidental details. Well, we've already commented on the third day, which set resurrection bells ringing until we switched them off. But now we read of Isaac carrying the wood for the sacrifice, an act which inevitably brings to mind Jesus carrying his cross. Now, if the New Testament picks up on a detail like that and clearly applies it as a fulfilled prophecy, as in the division of Jesus' clothes by the soldiers, for instance, all well and good. If not, I think we should be cautious in drawing a spiritual lesson out of it. But as here, if it reminds us of Christ and his sacrifice, then it's pulled us, hasn't it, towards the magnetic north of Scripture, so to speak. And that's good too. Verses 9 and 10. Faith in action. Well, Abraham goes about his business, as he would have done many times, but with one huge difference. Uh, Instead of killing a lamb and putting it on the altar, he ties his own son Isaac on it. And Isaac lets him. We have to stop and register Isaac's faith here. Uh, He is the patriarch about whom we hear by far the least. Uh, He and Rebecca have that lovely love story in Genesis 24, but then both have their favorites and the rest is history and a, a big mess, frankly. He's a chip off the old block, copping his dad in passing off his wife as his sister, in getting embroiled in a dispute over wells, and in making a peace treaty with the very same Abimelech. All very deja vu. But here, he appears to have copied the very best of his father, faith. I do wish, though, there was a verse in Hebrews 11 which said, by faith Isaac allowed himself to be tied on the altar, but there isn't. He only gets one line in that chapter. And it's a result of being deceived by Jacob. By faith, he blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. And I'm tempted to add yes, and it was back to front. I'll let you work that one out. But here, Isaac goes voluntarily, doesn't he? Just as Jesus will, centuries later. Isaac must have known how much his father loved him. I would have thought his parents would be tempted to wrap him in cotton wool. Uh, But I don't want to push that as far as one commentator who suggests uh, that's why God commanded Abraham to sacrifice him, because he loved Isaac too much. So we'll ignore that. From silence, we can't say much. But if we judge on the basis of obedience, Isaac passes the test with flying colors, doesn't he? He trusted his father. He trusted his God. And Abraham picks up the knife. God had given Abraham a son, Now he asks Abraham to give him back. John Currid says that verses 9 and 10 are an example of ritardando. I'll take his word on that. But which is apparently a technique used in music described as a gradual slacking of tempo in order to sharpen and heighten the tension. That's my excuse next time I don't keep the rhythm on the drums. But cue some pretty dramatic organ chords at this point. Yeah? Because this ritardando is is the idea of building and building and building the tension, slowing everything right down. He gets the wood, he builds the altar, he ties his son on, he lifts the knife, and then bang, the angel. You see, this is where jumping to Jesus would miss the reality. It's not simply a dress rehearsal for Calvary. Abraham really went to that mountain. Abraham really tied Isaac on the altar. Abraham really lifted the knife. Abraham was really about to kill his son. This is real world stuff. 
And then, fifthly, God provides the sacrifice. Because, verses 11 to 14, then the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven in the nick of time. And you should be breathless, shouldn't you, at that point? At the right time. So Abraham's faith is proved by all that's gone before, of course it is, but especially and fully by picking up the knife. He knows he has to kill his son. I'm intrigued by the comment uh, that occurs a number of times in Scripture, and here we have it in verse 12 in the, the mouth of the angel, for now I know that you fear God. Uh, I'm intrigued because obviously God knows God has always known. Two things occur to me about this. One, that God's knowledge is now based on Abraham's action. I know you fear me because of what you've done. But it's also true that now Abraham knows that God knows because God has told him. And so do we. Here is divine acknowledgement and approval of Abraham's faith. No better place to be in than that, is there? I take the angel to be God himself, or at least God speaking through the angel, as the reference to, uh, well, actually even more than that, because the reference to me at the uh, end of the verse seems to suggest that. In other words, this is the son of God, I think. Actually, the pre-incarnate Jesus speaking to Abraham. But I'm not making a big point of that. But remember that the Lord also appeared to Abraham and ate a meal with him. So in a sense, Abraham did know Jesus. And if I'm right on that, then it's Jesus who calls to Abraham from heaven and tells him not to kill Isaac. And that would be so appropriate, wouldn't it? Because he's the one who will die in his place. And ours, on the cross. A substitute was found for Isaac, but not for Jesus. And Abraham names the place Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. And indeed, in Jesus, the Lord did provide salvation on that mountain to all who believe. You rejoicing in that this evening? The trial is for Abraham's benefit. Now he knows that faith is effective. Had the ram been there all the time? Well, it may have been. I think Abraham was so engrossed in preparing the altar and tying Isaac on it, I doubt he'd seen it. If he had, it wouldn't be of much interest to him until God said stop. And so sixthly, in verses 15 to 19, very briefly, Abraham's faith is vindicated. Obedience leads to blessing. Abraham took God at his word and was amply rewarded because he didn't hold back even his beloved son. He was going to become the father of a great nation. Physical Israel, the old covenant kingdom, and of course spiritual Israel, all the descendants of Abraham. By now you can do the parallels to Jesus yourselves, can't you? Not my will, but yours be done. Did Abraham want to sacrifice Isaac? No, of course not. Did Jesus want to suffer the torture of crucifixion and bear the weight of sin? No, he had no martyr complex. But both Abraham and Jesus wanted to obey God, and they did. And just as Abraham was blessed and became the father of Israel, so Jesus was exalted and became the head of the new covenant people of God. Yet by his faith, Abraham also represents, doesn't he, all those who trust in Jesus. And in those last verses, the promise is actually, if you look carefully and compare it with the earlier promises, it's reiterated, but it's also expanded. And all those names at the end, I wanted them read because it takes us to Isaac's future wife. It's not just a random bunch of names because he needed to fill up the page. It shows the blessing that's coming. Now, I won't be, I hope, so mechanical tomorrow, uh, but tonight I'd like to close... Uh, by showing you a little bit of my working, uh, as it were, to try to uh, justify this approach to Old Testament narrative. Uh, Where can the the preacher or the Bible study leader, the Sunday school teacher, or even just Christian reader, go wrong in applying Genesis 22? Well, the first approach says, we must obey God, even if we don't understand the circumstances, and we must be like Abraham. Well, that's true as far as it goes, but it ignores the context of the promise, of the grounds on which Abraham could be confident in God despite what he was being asked to do. And, of course, it doesn't make any link to Jesus, which the Bible surely does. And the story remains remote to us because no parallels or links are made to us, other than in a very general sense. And we're never going to find ourselves in exactly the situation that Abraham was. The second approach 
says, well, just as Abraham was willing to sacrifice Isaac, so God was willing to sacrifice his only son, the Lord Jesus, on the cross. Well, of course, that's true too. We've already established that. But this time we've come so quickly to the New Testament that we haven't done justice to the original context. We haven't actually read the story properly, nor made any attempt to see the Abraham story as relevant as it stands. In other words, it's treating the Old Testament as just kind of waiting room to get to the new. Our third way approach then this evening, looking at applying Genesis 22, is like this. The actual circumstances of the passage are, of course, unique to Abraham. But some timeless principles emerge. God tests his children. God wants our prompt obedience. The whole of life, even the worst bits, are worship, or can be, if we have the right attitude. We can and we should trust God's provision. Obedience to God is more important than anything we love in this life, and God rewards obedience way beyond what it deserves. Do you see how this develops the truths of the first two approaches, but goes beyond them? It doesn't draw a kind of bang average application, have faith like Abraham. And how do you do that anyway? Well, it takes a lifetime of service. But it draws out much more specific application from the details of the passage. Neither does it simply say, this is an illustration of what Jesus did. But again, it, it, it highlights more and more specific parallels with the work of Jesus. It doesn't mean looking for symbolism in every single action, but looking for the principles that are operating behind the details. Ironically enough, I think actually, well, I hope is the case this evening, we've actually found more of Jesus in the passage than we would have done if we'd simply just jumped to the New Testament. Have you ever wondered which texts Jesus used in his sermon to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus? Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Well, I think we found enough in Genesis 22 to suggest he could have used this chapter. Uh, the passage is commented on uh, in two New Testament passages and in a normal sermon, I would have brought them in earlier. James 2, the famous section, where James argues that faith without works is useless, though note he doesn't say works are a part of what saves us. And exhibit A in that argument is Abraham in Genesis 22. Wasn't Abraham, he says, our father, justified by works in offering Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see that faith was active together with his works, and by works, faith was made complete, and the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as right, credited it to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. So saving faith leads to works, or shows itself by works, as Abraham did on Mount Moriah. He believed God. What, did he act, what actually did he believe? Well, the other passage that quotes Genesis 22 is Hebrews 11, and that helps us understand it. He says, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. He received the promises, and yet he was offering his one and only son, the one to whom it had been said, your offspring will be traced through Isaac. He considered God to be able even to raise someone from the dead. Therefore, he received him back, figuratively speaking. So he believed not even death would be too much for God to deal with. That if he killed Isaac, he could resurrect him, and he would resurrect him to keep his promise. So then, the key to all of this is what Abraham knows and understands about God. Uh, just because the text is silent, we don't have to uh, imagine him cheerfully whistling 10,000 reasons throughout his three-day hike to Moriah. But what sustains him and enabled him to be obedient was his absolute conviction that God would provide. If you're interested, you might like to ponder Galatians 3.16 later in this context, where Paul argues that no one was ever justified by keeping the law, but always by faith. And he uses Abraham as an example, someone who lived 430 years before the law was given. So how could he be justified by it? And he says this, now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He doesn't say to seeds, as though referring to many, but referring to one. And to your seed, who is Christ. So Isaac is saved because the Messiah must come through his line. 
God's provision then covers all our needs. Abraham might not have known where he was going, and he didn't know how things were going to turn out, but he did know where his hope and eternal future lay, and that's a timeless principle for us as well. He did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Romans 8, referring to Christ, of course. Abraham was willing to forfeit everything he had, the most precious thing he had, for the sake of his devotion to God. And Isaac was willing to let his father sacrifice him. God gave up his own son, and Jesus willingly gave up his own life for our sake. Will we respond in sacrificial faith? Let's pray together. Oh, Heavenly Father, it's uh, a difficult passage to contemplate a supreme test for Abraham and for Isaac, one that challenges our devotion, our willingness to be living sacrifices for you, but also one that gloriously points to the Lord Jesus Christ who willingly went to the cross for our sake and in obedience to his heavenly father. Lord, teach us the lessons that you want us to learn from this passage. Strengthen our faith in your provision, in your promises, including the promise to return for your people. And when you do, may we be found obeying you faithfully. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I hope you'll be able to come back tomorrow, but you can also watch it on the St. Andrew's Cheadle Hume YouTube Live. And in fact, some people are watching it even tonight. Uh, we didn't have a, a Keswick South Manchester last year because of the COVID, so we're going to have two this year because we're going to have one again in October when actually Nigel Atkinson from uh, Nutsford is going to be speaking. Um, and you might think, well, Jonathan's only come from Bramall. They're sure there won't be any cost. They haven't even provided tea and coffee this year. But don't worry, there's still a plate. And you, if you wouldn't wanted to leave a donation either tonight or tomorrow night towards the ongoing work of the, uh, the South Manchester Keswick, that would be grand. Um, you've already prayed, but I'm going to pray as well. You made me think of some things while you were talking. Lord, help us to know why we are alive, why you have given us faith. Help us to live giving you pleasure and to die knowing the gain, joyful because you yourself provide the sacrifice. Thank you for his obedience, his suffering. Thank you for his taking us into his people. And may we grow in faith and obedience to the praise of your glory. Amen.